Pulling up and pushing down data in the storage hierarchy. What does that mean? Well, pulling up data, of course, means reading. Reading is nothing but pulling up data in the storage hierarchy. So, for instance, if you want to read some data from hard disk into main memory, this is nothing but pulling up data from hard disk to main memory. And then we can pull it up even more to L3, L2, L1 and to the registers if you want. Only subsets, of course, and, and we always respect the inclusion property we learned about in the storage hierarchy video, but it's nothing but pulling up data. And pushing down data is nothing but writing. That's what we do when we write data. So be it that we update something in the registers, then the updates trickle down through all the layers and eventually make it to hard disk. And as I already explained in a previous video, there have to be components taking care about the pulling up and the pushing down of data. And depending on which layers in the storage hierarchy we're talking about, it may be implemented in hardware or it may be implemented in software. So in the following, we will look at this layer here or these two layers and what happens in between. So how to transfer data from hard disk to main memory, how to pull it up, how to read it into main memory and how to push it down, how to write it back from main memory to hard disk. This is really crucial in a database system. So later on we will also look at several optimizations, especially with respect to main memory databases. There we will look at those layers in more detail, but to start with I think it's important to understand those lower layers. As I already explained in the other video, you find the link here, there are many similarities among the layers. So once you understand an algorithm that works well, say on this layer, you can adapt it very quickly and very easily to work on the other layers as well. So the, the algorithms used in between the different layers are all super similar and based on the same techniques where they use different constants, you have to tweak them, they have to work on different granularities, but more or less they are super, super similar. So let's start with the software here. So what does the database do? So here in between main memory and flash disk, there's the database buffer. That is taking care of this process of reading and writing. And of course, what the database buffer does is, and that's why it is depicted like this, is it allocates some memory, so it has some share of the available DRAM of the main memory, but it controls how the transfer is done. So that's the database buffer sits in main memory with respect to the memory it allocates, but it controls the, the data exchange among those layers. So whenever, thing, whenever anything goes on here, the database buffer takes over the control. So what the database buffer does in principle is it reads some of the blocks from hard disk into main memory. And just one terminology thing here is, so before we talked about blocks, the blocks on a hard disk or on an SSD or whatever is underneath, once the database buffer reads those blocks, we don't call those blocks blocks anymore, but pages. So it's the same thing, it's the same data, say an eight kilobyte block of data here we are calling it a block, but once we read it here, we will be calling it a page. And then we operate on the page. Yeah? So the same data is called block on hard disk, but called a page once it is in main memory. So two concepts that are very important to understand in the context of the database buffer, but also in the context of any other caching mechanism, is temporal and spatial locality. So let's start with Temporal locality. What does that mean? So given a sequence of address references A1 to AN, in the general case address references may mean any arbitrary address in the memory we're talking about. However, usually there are some granularities. If you talk about hard disks, for example, we can only refer to certain pages or blocks. So what I mean by this sequence in the context of a hard disk is a reference sequence like page 1, page 7, page 42, maybe page 7 again, page 2, and so forth. This is a sequence of address references, of page references. 
And temporal locality, what does that express? It says there's a small distance in time for the same address, and same is very important. So let's make an example. Assume you want to load some blocks into my memory. So what do we do? Assume we load block number, and I'm calling it a page as explained above, page number 42. Then I'm loading block number seven, block number nine, and there's a block 42, then there's a block five, and then there's a block seven, and so forth. Yeah? This is the order we use to read blocks from disk into my memory. As you see here already, the same page 42 is here referred to twice, and the same holds for this page seven. And you also see that the distance among those two references is very little. So there are only two page references in between here, in between referring 42. And the same holds for page 7. Here the distance is relatively small. Here it's one more reference in between. It's three pages in between. But still this is a relatively small distance. So what temporal locality expresses here is that the same address is referred to with a small distance with respect to time. Of course, small is a relative term. We will look at that in the exercises. And that's what temporal locality expresses. And that's what we want to exploit in the database buffer. That is what the database buffer typically exploits. Obviously, in this situation, if there are many references to 42, we want to avoid rereading of this 42 again in this situation. We do not have to reread page 42 if it's still in main memory. And the same holds for page 7. At this point in time, we want to avoid reading it because we just read it four references ago. So we better have it still in main memory. And in this situation, we can gain something if we don't have to reread it here again. That is what the database buffer exploits. That is what any cache exploits. Avoid the rereading of data in this situation when there are many references to the same address close in time. That is temporal locality. But there's also another concept and that's called spatial locality. So what is spatial locality? We have the same assumptions. We have a sequence of address references A1 to AN. Let's assume there are references to pages. Spatial locality says there's a small distance in time for a similar address. That's the only change over the temporal locality is this word here, similar address. So we don't require the same address. That is what temporal locality expresses. Let's go back to that definition. So that is the definition of temporal locality. Here we said same address. Here we say a similar address. That is the only change here. In other words, this means spatial locality is a generalization of temporal locality. Temporal locality is a special case of spatial locality as it is more restrictive. So this is more restrictive to say we need the same address rather than a similar address. So let's look at an example again. Let's assume we have the same sequence of page references as above. So we have page 42, we have page 7, then we have page 9, then we have page 42 again, we have page 5, and we have page 7 again. So temporal locality said, okay, this is close in time and this is close in time. But what does spatial locality say? Spatial locality covers those two similarities, as explained above, but also covers distance and time for similar addresses. So 5 is similar to 7, you could say. So maybe we should define similarity first. So what does similar mean? Let's say simil similar is the distance and the page numbering is smaller than 2. So we need like a distance metric. Let's say we put in two pages, pi and pj, and we say that this should be smaller. So i minus j, that should be smaller than, say, 3. Yeah, that's our distance metric I use to express similarity here. So 
if the absolute distance of i and j is smaller or equal 3, then I say it's similar. And that holds for this here. Yeah? So the distance here is 2, this is smaller than 3. So this is similar with respect to the page numbering, to the address. So this would also be covered in spatial locality. Those pages are close with respect to their page numbering. And it also holds in between 9 and 7, of course. Yeah, that holds here, and it also holds here, of course. Here it's also a spatial locality. But why is that important to understand? Well, um, spatial locality is something that happens at multiple levels. So let's stick with a page level, with a block level. So where would that happen? So what hard disks actually do is, when they read, is they tend to read ahead, which means if you are interested in a particular page, page 7, let's say, the hard disk will often read adjacent pages. So the hard disk, even though you read only page 7, will also read page 8, page 9, and maybe also page 6 and page 5. So usually stuff that sits on the same track will be read. So this is spatial locality. It will read that at least into its hard disk cache. And then you have an effect with respect to spatial locality. Because at this situation, when you actually read it from the track and then there's a reference to 9, it might happen that this page already, already sits in the hard disk cache here. And then already you save something. This is already in the hard disk cache here, P9. And then you don't have to go back to the track. You can directly transfer it here. And then you gain something because you exploited the spatial locality in reading ahead. So this is a major effect happening at this level. So whenever your buffering strategy is doing something like that, read ahead, read ahead. Or you could also call that read adjacent, read adjacent, then this is basically exploiting spatial locality. And again, this technique may be, is implemented in hard disk, but it may also be implemented in the database buffer and the software, not only in the hardware or at any other level. So this is one aspect of spatial locality. However, as we will also see, there's another effect in spatial locality, and that is within the same pages. So, of course, assume you read the page 7 here into main memory. Let's do it again. It was read here. This is this page 7, let's say. It's read into main memory. So, now we got it here. And, of course, the database system eventually has to look inside the page. What sits inside the page, which is usually some tuples or rows that, that you're refer referring to. So, it might be that you have then references to two rows which sit on the same page. So assume there's a row one and this and a row two and they sit on the same page. So if you go away from sequences of address references that are operating on the granularity of pages but go to a more fine granular level, then we have references like say row one row 2, row 7, row 1 again, and so forth. And here again, uh, the same observations hold as with temporal and spatial locality. So temporal locality, of course, is this here. Spatial locality is this. This is spatial locality. It's a similar address with respect to the rows. It's the same address with respect to the pages because row 1 and row 2 happen to sit on the same page here. That's what I explained here. I assume this sits on page 7. So this means even though we have only temporal locality at the level of pages, we have spatial locality at the level of rows. And as we have this spatial locality, the database buffer here also helps us in avoiding an extra axis. So if row 2 were placed on a different page, we would have to read another page. But as it happens to sit on the same page, 
spatial locality boils down to the same access to the same page. And as this page already sits in main memory, we don't have an extra access. So with respect to the data inside the page, we have spatial locality, which is translated to temporal locality on the page level. So bottom line, at the level of pages, the database buffer is exploiting temporal locality. And the database buffer will try to keep the pages that are referred to often in main memory. It will try to keep a hot set of the pages that get many, many references. With respect to spatial locality, depending on the implementation of the database buffer, it may do stuff like reading ahead or reading adjacent pages. So if you refer to a page eight, it may also read other pages into main memory, but it depends on the implementation. That is spatial locality at the level of pages, but there's the other effect of spatial locality that is within the pages. If you are looking at row references, then there's gonna be spatial locality inside the page, which can also be exploited. So the database buffer will also help with spatial locality if those references to rows happen to sit on the same page. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you. So if you want to see more database videos, be it in English or in German, take a look at my website datenbankenlernen.de. It has a couple of English and German videos. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel, Jens Did, or you look at our website, infosys.uni-saarland.de. See you there.